Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our webinar this morning. We're very excited to bring you an update on the failure to prevent corrupt activities offense. And I'm really delighted to see so many familiar names on the attendee list, and I hope that you get a lot of value out of today's session. I'm going to be introducing you to Adrian Rue and Vim Stone. Adrian is a senior associate in the forensics team. He's one of the bright, young, shining stars in the forensic space, and he'll be sharing a lot of information about this important piece of legislation that has just been promulgated very, very quietly. It slipped under the radar screen during the course of the end of last year. But we are living in really difficult times at the moment. We've got the Israel-Palestine conflict. Prior to that, we've had the Russia-Ukraine conflict, and both of these conflicts have had a devastating impact on sanctions compliance, and it has made life very complicated for many of you. The South African government is about to make things a bit more complicated in its endeavors to get off the gray list quickly. 2024 is going to be a watershed year. It's an asset test for the South African government to demonstrate to the Financial Action Task Force and the world that we are doing enough to clamp down on corruption, money laundering, et cetera. And you are going to see a spate of new initiatives by government, new pieces of legislation that has been promulgated to try and ensure that our systems are robust and we have sufficient in place to address corruption. The world is also getting tougher. The US government has passed the Foreign Extortion Prevention Act, which Adrian will explain later, can also have impact on this new South African legislation that has been passed. The UK Bribery uh, Act is also set to receive a boost with additional legislation being promulgated and a, an expansion of jurisdiction and the ambit of that legislation, as well as a new head of the SFO. So I think what is important for me is that for all of you out there, you need to make sure that your defense mechanisms are in place, that you are doing sufficient to prevent corrupt activities within your own organization. And we're going to keep you updated with lots of insights as the new pieces of legislation is issued. We will alert you and sensitize you to the new amendments and initiatives. And we will also be hosting a series of seminars as the legislation and initiatives come out. We will initiate seminars like today's to make sure that we help you to stay on top of the game. And then, as always, if you need any assistance in implementing some of the new requirements, please don't hesitate to reach out. And on that note, I'm going to hand over to Adrian and my team um, to take you through what today is all about. So thank you, Adrian. Over to you. Thank you so much, Stephen. And good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, depending on your time zone. Uh, as Stephen has alluded to, the topic of today's discussion will be the proposed and new offense of failure to prevent corrupt activities. Um, it, it comes at an interesting time, as, as Stephen has alluded to. So, so the new offense, which we will go through, really targets the uh, supply side of the corrupt transactions. So we're looking at the person that's offering or giving uh, bribes, as opposed to the demand side, which the uh, US DOJ now has the power to target through the uh, Foreign Extortion Prevention Act. Um, and, and there you're targeting the recipients of the bribes. So it's an interesting time. Um, and as Stephen said, you know, it's, it's very important that we make sure that we've got the, uh, the, the controls in place to, to make sure that we mitigate the risks. So, so today, today what we'll be looking at is firstly an overview of the proposed offense, the current status. We'll have a look at why the offense has been proposed. Uh, my colleague firm in the dispute resolution department will go through a bit of the detail with you, have a look at what the current position is and what the new position will be. Uh, importantly, we'll have a look at the adequate procedures defense that's been built into this new offense and the practical considerations that flow from that. Uh, we'll have a look at deferred prosecution agreements in South Africa and the scope for introducing those. And if time permits, we'll, uh, we'll have a Q&A session. And, and in this regard, please, can you just post all of your questions in the Q&A uh, portion? So, so the new proposed offense uh, was introduced via the Judicial Matters Amendment Bill, 
uh, which passed through National Assembly and the National Council of Provinces right at the end of last year. It is currently awaiting presidential assent, which we anticipate will be soon. And I'll discuss exactly why we, we feel that way shortly. Uh, but what the bill does is it, it contains a proposed amendment to the principal anti-corruption statute in South Africa, which is the Prevention and Combating of Corrupt Activities Act, or PRECA, and by way of inclusion of a new Section 34A offence. Vim will walk you through some of the detail and the elements, but very simply put, if a person associated with a member of the private sector or incorporated state-owned entity bribes another person intending to obtain or retain business or an advantage for that member, then it's the member itself that commits uh, the offence. However, uh, the, no offence will be committed where that member had in place what's referred to as adequate procedures designed to prevent persons associated with it from engaging in uh, such corrupt practices. So the origins of, of the new offence uh, stem from the Zondo report, or the State Capture Commission report. There, Chief Justice Zondo specifically re recommended that we introduce an amendment to PRECA to provide for what, uh, what he referred to as the failure to prevent bribery offence. Uh, for those that are familiar with uh, the UK regime, it'll be immediately identifiable. In fact, the wording that's in the Zondo report uh, contains almost a mirror image of Section 7 of the UK Bribery Act. And there they have a, an offence of uh, failure to prevent bribery. So in, in the course of implementing Zondo's recommendations, we've now got this new proposed amendment to PRECA. The wording is slightly changed. We, in, in PRECA, we don't have the term bribery. It's not referred to. But the various corrupt offences uh, that uh, that Brecker criminalises is more than broad enough to cover a bribery as traditionally understood. So that's where it comes from. And then if you look to the purpose of this new legislation, firstly, it's to give effect to the Zondo recommendations. And secondly, if you look at the, the behavioural change we're trying to introduce, it's to proactively encourage organisations uh, to, to actively take steps to prevent uh, corruption from happening in the first place. So I'm going to hand over now uh, to my colleague, Vim, who's going to walk through some of the details and some of the intricacies in the new offence before we then move on to an analysis of, of what adequate procedures are and, and what you really need to be doing to prepare for the introduction of the offence. Thanks very much, Adrian, and good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for attending this uh, webinar. As Adrian mentioned, I'll be having a closer look at this new offence. And what I intend to do is firstly look at what the main aim of this new offence is uh, and what the nature of the offence is. Secondly, we'll take a bit of a deep dive into the elements of this new offence, looking at who, what and how. Uh, thirdly, we'll look at a couple of examples just to illustrate the, the practical uh, implementation of this, this new offence. And then finally, what I'll do is I'll compare the current uh, legal regime with the proposed new position. But before I do so, perhaps just some uh, introductory thoughts from, from my side. Firstly, and just for a bit of uh, additional context, um, Adrian and his team is what I'd like to call the your first line of defense. They will do their utmost to ensure that you do not perhaps inadvertently commit the Section 34A offense. We in the dispute resolution department, we are your second and final line of defense. We are there to uh, help you in the unfortunate uh, event where you are, uh, you may have inadvertently again, perhaps committed this offence. But we, of course, hope we never get there. Um, secondly, this really is quite a significant uh, legal shift in our uh, legal system, and it has far-reaching consequences. The the good news and the bad news are the same, and that is. This new offense is by no means a, a model of clarity. And uh, let's take a look at why I, I say so. So the main aim of this offense, uh, as Adrian had mentioned, the main aim of this offense is primarily to stop uh, the private sector 
from bribing, bribing or buying business. So although it also applies to uh, un, uh, incorporated state-owned entities, I would suggest that the primary aim is directed toward the private sector. Uh, secondly, it's to prevent the buying of business and not the selling of business. And in my slides, Adrian helpfully included the supply and demand words that you see that it almost seems like bribery is becoming a new economical term, which is perhaps appropriate. So what that means is if a company or an individual, an employee within a company accepts a bribe, that company will not fall foul possibly of Section 34A, even if it did not have adequate procedures in place to prevent that particular employee from accepting a bribe. That is the main aim. Secondly, what's the nature of this offense? And um, this is quite a difficult or perhaps controversial aspect of the new offense. So I'm not going to dwell on it. I think the upshot of it is this. The onus to prove this offense will remain on the prosecution or, or on the state. Practically speaking, what this means is the state will need to prove all the elements or at least make a case out, a prima facie case. And once they've done that, the evidentiary burden will likely shift to the accused to show that they had indeed uh, had uh, re uh, adequate procedures in place uh, in order to prevent uh, these corrupt activities. And it's only once they've uh, done that that they will not be uh, convicted of the particular crime. Let's now look at a bit more detail of at the different elements of the offense. So we'll look at who are the actors, what do they need to do, and how do they need to do that? And I think it will, might be helpful just for me to remind you exactly about the wording of the act, uh, of the particular provision. It says, any member of the private sector or incorporated state-owned entity will be guilty of an offense if a person associated with that member of the private sector or incorporated state-owned entity um, gives or agrees or offers to give any gratification prohibited in terms of chapter two to another person intending to re obtain or retain business or uh, an advantage in the conduct of that business. So we've got quite a couple of actors. In fact, we've got four. The first two and the last one are really passive actors. And the third one, the associated person, is really the only active participant, I would say, in this offense. Let's look at each of one, each one of them in a bit more detail. Firstly, what does member mean? And in particular, does it include natural persons as well? So the, legis the, the act doesn't define what member means. If one has a look at the, the rest of PRECA, it would suggest that member does, in fact, indeed include a natural person. But the debate is really solved when one looks at the definition, definition of private sector, which is defining the act. Private sector is defined as all persons or entities, including any natural person or group of natural persons syndicates, agencies, trusts, partnerships, funds, corporate bodies. So the definition is quite wide. It excludes, however, all public bodies, public officers, um, members of the legislative authority, uh, of the judicial authority, and so forth. So the public is completely excluded. The public sector is ex uh, explicitly excluded from that definition. Secondly, what does incorporated state-owned entity mean? Well, I think that is luckily quite straightforward. It would be your state-owned companies, uh, ESCOM, Transnet, uh, SAA, companies like that. Interestingly and importantly, what is not included is your general government departments, uh, for example, the, the Department of Defense. And the reason is likely because departments within government, within the public, ordinarily would not 
buy business. They are not in the business of, of, of course, generating profit. And that's perhaps the reason why they weren't included. Then thirdly, perhaps the most important definition in this proposed, in this new uh, offense, and that is the definition of associated person. Luckily, the offense gives us an idea of what that would mean. It's defined as a person who performs services for or on behalf of the private sector or that member of the private sector or that incorporated state-owned entity. And again, importantly, irrespective of the capacity in which that person performs services. So the definition is really wide. It will include, as we'll see in, in, in a couple of moments, contractors, subcontractors, service providers. Um, so it's a far reaching provision. And then finally, the person accepting the gratification. And the reason why I say that person has a passive role, because it's not a requirement for that person to actually accept. It's sufficient for the associated person to give or, or rather to offer to give or to promise, and we'll get to that in a moment, to promise a gratification. That's it for the who. Secondly, what? What needs to happen? There are two things that need to happen. That associated person will need to give, agree, or offer to give any gratification. So what does gives or agrees or offers to give mean? Luckily, again, it's defined in the act, and it's defined very broadly. Uh, it includes a promise, uh, 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 an agreement to, or a offer to lend, grant, procure, or confer. So it's it's extremely wide. As far as gratification is concerned, that too is defined very widely. Uh, in short, it includes everything, money in whatsoever form, a gift, a donation, a loan, a fee, a reward, valuable security, and even an avoidance of loss. So in short, any type of advantage. So that's the first part. But secondly, it has to be, that gratification has to be prohibited in terms of chapter two of PRECA. And chapter two includes a whole host of offenses. I'm not going to list all of them, but just to give you an, an, an idea, it includes the general offense of corruption, then also specific instances of corruption, including relating to specific persons, for example, public officers, a members of the legislative authority and so forth and then also specific matters for example relating to contracts tenders auctions sporting events and so forth so really this offense this section 34a offense is a two-pronged offense the the prosecution will firstly have to prove the chapter two offense the general corruption offense and then they will have to go a bit further to also prove that all the elements of 34A, the remaining elements of 34A, have been met. And then to the final question, how? How should they give or that person give or agree or offer to give gratification? Well, it has to be with the intention to obtain or retain business or an advantage. So to illustrate, if someone paid a gratification to someone else, but the purpose was not to retain or obtain business, Section 34A does not come into play. Practically, for example, if a, an employee in company A pays company B a bribe in order for that employee's son, for example, to get a position in company B, that wouldn't fall within Section 34A. And the reason is it's, it's it, it, the intention behind paying that bribe was not intended to obtain or retain business. Business is defined in the Act, but rather unhelpfully because it, it says it means business, trade, occupation, profession, calling, 
but that is not really what the term business in section 34a envisages it rather, it rather refers to some sort of commercial undertaking and then the same goes for advantage advantage is not defined either although we are given a clue as to how it will ultimately be interpreted because the section says that the advantage should be in the conduct of business so it cannot be an advantage that is completely unrelated to the business of that particular um, member of the private sector or incorporated state-owned entity. But to illustrate all of this, let's have a look at a few examples. Company A appoints a third-party uh, service provider, let's call it B, which promises to assist with regulatory license applications. Uh, B pays bribes to government officials responsible for the issuance of those licenses to company A. In those circumstances, company A has likely contravened section 34A. And as lawyers, we always say likely because they, we always hope to find some other loophole. But for present purposes, it probably, unless it had in place adequate procedures designed to prevent B from bribing. That's, a, that's one of the examples. And interestingly, again, you will note that the person, the service provider B is, is not an employee or director. It's completely separate from the, the company, except that it provides a service to the company A. A second example is perhaps where E is an independent contractor working at a company, let's call it C, a multi, multinational FMCG, uh, he is eager to meet his target and secure permanent employment, so he decides to offer a procurement manager at C's customer a kickback if she agrees to manipulate an RFP process in favor of C. Again, company C may well have committed the offense of, of failing to prevent corrupt activities unless it had in place adequate procedures. And then a final example, which I think is quite a tricky example. Let's say F is a company which manufactures machinery. It has a distribution agreement with G to sell machinery to government departments. G then goes and bribes government officials in order to secure contracts. Let's assume F had no procedures in place to prevent bribing. Did uh, F contravene section 34A? And why I say this is quite a difficult example is one will have to go and look at that distribution agreement to see whether the, the, the company or the, the distributor G is offering any services to, the, to F. If it's merely buying machinery from F and there's no services being provided, then G won't, or F, if it did not have adequate procedures in place, would not have contravened Section 34A because G didn't provide any services to F. I'll come to a few other examples uh, in, a, in a moment. So before I hand back uh, to Adrian, let's just have a quick look at the current legal position versus the, 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 the legal position after um, Section 34A is signed into law. A brief recap, firstly. 34A, we know it's in PRECA. We know it's an offense to fail to prevent corrupt activities. And we know the ultimate purpose is to prevent people from buying business. And therefore, ultimately, to ensure adequate procedures are in place to prevent corruption. That will be the new position. But our current position is, is as follows. We can look at two provisions that relate to 34A. The first one is section 34, the, the section just preceding section 34A. Uh, or section 34, the section that just precedes section 34A. 
that section says that any person that holds a position of authority has a duty to report certain corrupt acts, including bribery, corruption, fraud, theft, if it amounts to more than 100,000 rand. If that particular person fails to do so, that in and of itself is a criminal offence. The purpose of that particular provision is to prevent entities or the government uh, uh, departments, it's, it's very wide, companies, from concealing crimes. What we saw happen before the introduction of Section 34 was that companies would rather just dismiss an employee that, that was uh, guilty of an offence without reporting that particular employee to the police. And the reason they would not report it is, uh, I would suggest, twofold. Firstly, they would be concerned about the reputational damage that could ensue. But secondly, if they do report it, and we'll get to that in a moment, they would be concerned that if it's investigated, it could ultimately lead to the prosecution of the company. So even though Section 34's purpose is not really aligned with the purpose of Section 34A, we can still see why they are uh, put in preca at more or less the same place. They are associated with, with one another. The last provision, and this is part of our law currently, is Section 332 of the Criminal Procedure Act. And this is really a far-reaching provision. And I'm not sure everybody is always aware of this particular provision. In short, and I'm, I'm oversimplifying it on this slide, it's quite a detailed section. But in short, it says that any act or omission by a director or a servant of a corporate body, which includes, of course, companies and the like, in the exercise of that director or servant's powers, or in the interests of that corporate body shall be deemed to be the actions of that corporate body. So in short, the actions of a director or a servant will be attributed to the company. What is the purpose of that provision? Well, I would suggest that it is, of course, to hold corporates liable for acts by their directors. But why? Its ultimate purpose is to ensure that companies and the like have adequate measures in place to prevent corporate crimes, which is very similar to the purpose of Section 34A. So if we then go to the interplay between this different, these different provisions, the question, of course, arises, but what is the need of Section 34A, if we already have a provision that says corporates can be convicted and prosecuted? Well, I would say that the reason is, there are two reasons. The first reason is Section 34A goes wider. We've just seen that Section 34A speaks of associated persons, and we've seen how wide that provision is. It could include persons or service providers that don't, that aren't intim intimately or intricately involved in the concerned company at all. So Section 34A just costs the net a bit wider. That is the first reason. The second reason is Section 34A gives, now gives a very, very clear incentive to companies to prevent uh, uh, corporate uh, crime. It says, here is a defense. We're giving you a hint. This is what you can do to prevent uh, uh, falling foul of this provision. With that said, and interestingly, it's of course not a defense if the prosecution relies on section 332 for a company to say, but we had adequate procedures in place, that that offense does not apply to section 332. 
let's also look at a practical example of how all these provisions are intertwined. Let's assume that there is a director at company A who pays a bribe in order to obtain business from company B. If the other directors of company A knows or know or suspect that a bribe has been paid, they will be under a duty in terms of section 34 of PRECA to report that knowledge or suspicion to the Hawks or the Directorate of Priority Crime Investigations. Once that report is made, an investigation should ensue. In our experience, it doesn't happen all the time, but it, it's supposed to. What then will happen, or could happen rather, is a prosecution could follow, not only of that particular director who paid the bribe, but also possibly of that company. And again, not only in terms of Section 34A, because they didn't have adequate procedures in place, but perhaps because the, the, the prosec prosecution will attribute the actions of that particular director to that corporate company. So the corporate company could be, could be held liable for both contravening Section 34A and for contravening the general bribery offense uh, pursuant to Section 332. So with that in mind, the question also then arises is, would the introduction of Section 34A not disincentivize companies from making reports under Section 34? It could notionally, but we don't think it should. The reason we say it could is because companies might feel that, or directors might feel that, we are not going to report this to the police because we're concerned that they will ultimately use that report, do the investigation, and then prosecute the company. That's why we say it could. The reason we say it should not is because, and this is important, the duty to report corrupt transactions is a duty that rests on the individual director or person in the in a position of authority. So if that person fails to report that particular corrupt activity, he or she themselves in their personal capacity can be held criminally liable and can be imprisoned. So that is why we say it should not really, because the person who has a duty to report will most likely look after themselves instead of their own company. And that is it from my side. I'm going to hand back now to um, Adrian just to deal with the adequate procedures defense. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you so much, Vim. I think uh, that now that Vim has suitably frightened everyone, I think it's good for us to shift the focus to what you can do to mitigate uh, some of these risks. So uh, as Vim's covered, the, the new proposed offense contains a defense of adequate procedures. Uh, and for those of you that are familiar with the UK Bribery Act, uh, adequate procedures is a term directly borrowed from, from the Bribery Act. So if you, as an organization, for example, have in place procedures designed to prevent those associated persons from bribing on your behalf, then you will not be, uh, then you will not be liable um, for a contravention of 34A. The, the term adequate procedures has been subject to quite a bit of criticism in the UK. Uh, it's an inherently vague term. It, it perhaps doesn't lend itself neatly uh, to, to legal analysis in, in the way that other terms might, and I'll get to that. Um, but, you know, there's actually been a shift as well. If you look to the new, uh, the new legislation in the UK, the uh, recently um, introduced failure to prevent fraud offence, there's been a shift towards new terminology. And, and there, what we're referring to is, you know, what procedures were reasonable in the circumstances. Uh, and there is a view um, that adequate procedures should be read as meaning no more than what was reasonable in the circumstances. Because, of course, if procedures are in place and bribery happens in any event, by, by their very nature, those procedures were inadequate, which is quite circular. So 
we, when we talk about adequate procedures, we should really look at, um, you know, what is reasonable in the circumstances for the company to have put in place. Uh, the UK Bribery Act made it mandatory for the government to publish guidance on what exactly adequate procedures are, and, and they did publish that guidance. Uh, unfortunately, the, uh, the Section 34A does not include such a mandatory requirement to publish guidance. Um, but we would submit, given the history of the legislation and the similarity between it and Section 7 of the UK Bribery Act, it would be strongly advisable to follow uh, the, the approach which is outlined in the UK Bribery Act. Uh, so what, what the UK guidance, the Bribery Act guidance outlines is a, a principled approach, um, a six principles approach rather, which you should follow to inform the procedures that you put in place to prevent bribery. It's quite important when looking at the guidance to remember, and it's clearly stated in the guidance, that it's, it's not prescriptive uh, and there's no one size fits all approach uh, to adequate procedures. What you have to do is look at the particular uh, organization. So you can't take an off the shelf compliance program and, and implement it at a company and expect that to be sufficient for adequate procedures. And when I talk about the particular circumstances of, of the organization, I'm talking about the first principle, which is proportionality. And, and here, and this is by, by some measure, I would say the most important of all six principles. When we talk about proportionality, we're saying, are the procedures that the particular organization has put in place to prevent bribery from happening or its associates from bribery on its, uh, bribing on its behalf, are those procedures um, do they match the particular risks that the organization faces and have they been appropriately tailored in that regard? Um, and so it, there might be a knee jerk response, you know, when seeing this new offense to, to rush to implement new policies, new procedures and controls. But that would really be putting the cart before the horse. What you want to do is first stop and take stock. What are the particular risks that are facing the organization? And only once you've got a good understanding of those risks, then move on to the particular controls that you want to implement. I think by way of example, you might have a multinational company with thousands of employees that's doing business in various high risk jurisdictions. Now, in that case, your controls are going to be very different to a small uh, organization that's only concerned domestically and has very few third party engagements to expect both to have the same compliance team to have the same sorts of con controls in place would, of course, be a nonsense. So the the concept of proportionality is critical and, and it's something to really bear in mind. And if I can leave one uh, takeaway message uh, with everyone, it's that the first step here, if you haven't already done so, is to conduct a risk assessment so that you understand what are the organization's risks. And then we start talking about what particular procedures do we need to put in place. Um, moving on from that, the, the second principle is top level commitment, commonly referred to as tone from the top. So here we're, what we mean is, are the senior figures in the organization seen to be living the particular compliance program that you've got in place? Are they communicating the organization's commitment to its anti-corruption uh, stance? And are they seen to be complying or are they seen to be above the law, so to speak? So it's very important that the messaging is coming from the top because the, the idea is that the rest of the organization will follow and that culture that you're instilling within the organization must come from senior leadership. Uh, the third principle is risk assessment, which I've covered as part of the discussion on proportionality. Uh, the fourth principle is due diligence. Uh, this is also a particular control that you'll implement as part of your procedures. The idea here is, do you know who you're engaging? Do you know about these uh, who the service providers that you're engaging, who are they, what are they doing, have you conducted due diligence, and if you've conducted due diligence, have you found anything wrong, and if you have, why did you proceed, because you can still proceed, but if you have proceeded, uh, what controls have you have you got in place, because if we fast forward to, to the worst case scenario, and that particular third party bribes on your behalf, the question will then be, did you do due diligence on them in the first place, and if you did, did you flag things? And if you did and you continued anyway, you could be in a bad space. But if you continue with that engagement and you put in place appropriate, reasonable, or adequate procedures, then you might well have a defense, even though uh, the, the particular controls didn't work in that instance. 
And I think that's important. And, and that is spelled out in the guidance as well. It's, it's unrealistic to expect even the gold standard compliance program to be 100% effective all the time. It's important, though, that you did your best and you did implement these procedures. Uh, moving on from due diligence, we've got the fifth principle, which is communication. And here, what we're really talking about is uh, you've got policies in place, but that's not sufficient. You can't have what the DOJ refer to as a paper program. You've got to effectively implement uh, these uh, these policies. So here, you know, how do you implement? Well, make sure firstly that your particular policies are clear and that they're accessible for all employees or all third parties as well as appropriate. It's also important that you've appropriately trained uh, all stakeholders on the content of your policies, and and that should be effective training as well. And and here, the DOJ refers to. Uh, certain considerations like, are you perhaps assessing comprehension of, of these policies? Um, you, you might all have encountered those IT training uh, uh, videos um, that, that are often circulated in organizations that have a little quick quiz at the end. Those are the sort of things we're looking for uh, to make sure that people aren't sitting there and, and switching off and, and checking their emails while they're being trained. There has to be a, a degree of proper engagement with the content and, and you know, that's a very important part of implementation. So the key message is you can't just take something off the shelf, have a paper program that you don't really implement. Window dressing isn't going to cut it. You've really got to uh, effectively implement these policies. And then the, the last principle is that of monitoring and review. Obviously, uh, the risk environment that a particular organization is operating in is dynamic. It's going to be changing. Perhaps you're entering into a new market. Perhaps you're changing uh, the, the scope of your business. Whatever it might be, uh, you need to be alive to the fact that things are changing and you can't just implement this com com uh, compliance program and then leave it and, and let it gather dust on the shelf. You've got to continually monitor your organization, your organization's risks, and then appropriately tailor uh, all of your controls as you go along. Uh, so, so those uh, were the uh, the six principles from the, the UK guidance. And, and as I said, uh, very strongly advisable for you to tailor um, your, your compliance program to align with that until we have more clarity, uh, locally at least, and, and perhaps we will get some form of guidance at some stage. But for now, given the similarity with the UKBA, um, I, I would strongly recommend tailoring uh, to, to suit and to mirror uh, the UK Bribery Act guidance. Uh, the, the next topic I'd like to cover is a deferred prosecution agreements. Um, for, for those of you that Adrian, perhaps... can I just stop there? Just before we sure. go into DPAs, and I think DPAs is another important aspect in terms of new legislation that is pending, we are gonna see some amendments regarding DPAs because it's another one of the Zondo recommendations. But I just, I absolutely agree with Adrian, we should use the guidance that has been issued by the UK, but South Africa has also issued a CIPC guideline in 2018, and that set out you know, what the principles are for an effective compliance program. And it is very similar to the UK Bribery Act. It's modeled on those same principles. The only difference is risk assessment is a principle in terms of UK Bribery Act guidance. And that is taken out of the CIPC guidance. In its place, they've put auditing and accounting controls. And so the top management commitment leading by example is still there. Having clear practical policies and procedures is still there. And that, that means you've got to make sure that your organization controls areas where corruption flourishes. So gifts, entertainment, travel, political contributions, charitable donations, sponsorships, policies around facilitation payments and the solicitation and extortion is also important. And then the communication and training is mirrored in the CIPC guide, guidelines. And then instead of monitoring, they talk about periodic reviews. So you've got to test what is happening. Are people declaring gifts and entertainment? Are people sticking to the limits? Do you have robust policies around what you do with government officials and are your people compliant? And then the last principle, as I mentioned earlier, is 
auditing and accounting controls. The other guidance that we use is a number of our team have been accredited as lead implementers of ISO 37001, the ISO standard for effective anti-bribery management standards. And these principles are echoed in the ISO standard as well. So if you stick to the principles as outlined in the UK, you take cognizance of what the CIPC have said, and you manage that process, then you should be in a position where you can demonstrate that you've got adequate procedures to prevent corruption. And I think it will be very difficult for any um, government department or regulator to take issue with your organization if you've done this. The last item I just want to touch on is the risk assessment. One of the questions we're going to leave you with to answer yourselves when you leave the session today is when last did you do an anti-corruption, anti-fraud risk assessment? And if the answer is five or 10 years ago, it is important that you refresh. And as Adrian indicated, you know the risks are evolving, the compliance is in, evol evolving, and it's important that you understand where the gaps are in your own organization and what are the key risks that you are exposed to. So thank you, Adrian. It was an unplanned interjection, but I just wanted to add these few points. Thank you. No, thanks so much, Stephen. I think that's that's spot on and, and, and very helpful. Um, so just jumping back to uh, deferred prosecution agreements, uh, for, for those not familiar, um, effectively, and I am simplifying, it's an agreement between the prosecution and the accused company. Uh, what you'll typically see is the company will admit wrongdoing, they will agree to pay back any ill-gotten gains, they'll pay a, a criminal penalty. Um, in exchange, they will avoid uh, an actual conviction and, and all the consequences that would, would flow from that that the, the organization obviously wants to, to avoid. Um, there are pros and cons um, you know, for, for DPAs, but they have been successfully used in the US and the UK. Um, an important point is that they will apply to the, uh, the corporate body itself and not, for example, the implicated individuals that might be behind the scenes. So whilst the company will uh, avoid prosecution provided that it complies with the terms of the DPA, the prosecution is uh, still free to go after any implicated individuals, uh, which is quite an important uh, point to note. We don't uh, currently have a, a DPA regime in South Africa, um, but it is something that was recommended by Chief Justice Sondo in his report. And in response there to the presidency has confirmed that it is something that uh, the Law Reform Commission is currently seized with. And I understand that it is being uh, you know, considered seriously. In the interim, however, notwithstanding the fact that we don't have a DPA regime yet, uh, what the NPA, the National Prosecuting Authority in South Africa, is relying on is an internal corporate alternative dispute resolution directive. What that lets it do is enter into settlement agreements that are very similar in outcome to a DPA. Um, hopefully, though, we will see a formal DPA regime introduced, um, but it's good you know, to know that we do still have a mechanism in place to get these outcomes. Uh, and there was a recent example uh, of such an outcome that um, we saw this month. Uh, an, an organization was um, entered into a settlement agreement with the MPA in conjunction with the, the DOJ and the states. And you know it's good. We can see there's actually action being taken. But as I said, it will be great to see a, a formal DPA regime, hopefully in the near future. So if I can leave a, a few thoughts and, and conscious, you know, we don't have too much time and it would be nice if we can leave some time to address some questions. Um, if I can leave you with a few thoughts, the offense is absolutely on the way. Uh, there is a concerted effort to implement as many Zondo recommendations as possible. And this is one of them. So I have little doubt that it will be in, uh, implemented soon and, and signed into law. But, you know, it's not all bad news. It does increase your risk. Uh, but of course, there is the adequate uh, procedures defense, which, which is in place. The offense is new in South Africa, but the, the so what, the, the actions you need to take to mitigate this risk, that isn't new. We can learn from the US, we can learn from the UK, and we've got a wealth of, of, of benchmarking uh, sources that we can use when really developing the, the compliance program within an organization. And um, as Vim highlighted uh, in the analysis, the definition of associated persons is incredibly broad and it, it really requires careful analysis. Who are you doing business with and what are they doing? And, and are there 
sufficient controls in place to make sure that you are mitigating these risks? Are, are there agreements in place, for example, that contain robust anti-bribery and corruption uh, compliance clauses? There's a whole host of procedures you can put in place, and, and it's it's critical that uh, that you do so, given the, the imminent introduction of the offence. And then perhaps more broadly, if, if we just zoom out and look at what's happening on the global stage, we kicked off uh, the presentation with a mention to, to the new um, Foreign Extortion Prevention Act in the States. Um, you know, if, if we look at the expanded powers of the DOJ to now go after the recipients of bribes um, being foreign uh, public officials, it's not much of a stretch to think as part of the investigations into those potential offenses, the DOJ might stumble across the supply side. So the organizations on the other side and that increased scrutiny brings increased risk. So even if we didn't have this new offense in South Africa, it would be a good idea to, to bolster compliance programs. And then in addition to that, we've got a, a new head of the SFO in the UK, who I'd imagine is keen to, to leave his mark and, and um, show the, the effectiveness of, of the SFO's office. And we've also got the new failure to prevent fraud offense in the UK and, and fraud and corruption often go hand in hand. You know, uh, For example, an organization might um, maintain a slush fund in order to pay bribes, and it's not going to record that in its book. So there might be a, a, an issue of fraudulent misstatement there. So there's quite a lot to consider, and it's a, it's a really um, incredible time in this space, and there's a lot to consider. But the key, key message is put in place the adequate procedures, and, um, and, and then you will be you know, in a good space to mitigate your risks. But, uh, but thanks so much, everyone. Uh, Vim and I will... I see we've got some time, so we'll review uh, the questions and and we'll you know leave some time for to answer those. But thank you so much. Thanks, um, Adrian. Perhaps while you read, I've got the, I had the benefit of reading a couple of the questions while you were busy presenting. Um, Dion, you asked asked a very uh, interesting question. Um, you, you said uh, Section thirty four has been in force for a long time, and there's really not been any prosecution of that offence. Um, what makes us think that the the, the prosecution of thirty four A will be any different? So I think you're right. I mean, I don't. Uh, our firm often reports uh, or submit reports in terms of Section 34. And to be honest, and someone else commented on that as well, we don't often see a lot of action once the report is made. So um, will there be a, a, a any prosecution of 34A? I think the answer is yes. And the reason I say so is I think it will be easier to convict under 34A despite the fact that it's still quite unclear. Uh, and this is because um, Section 34 is really quite confusing and it's difficult to prosecute under 34 because you have to prove that the person knew or ought to have known or suspected or ought to have suspected. But how, it's so difficult to prove actual knowledge or suspected knowledge. And that's, I think, one of the big reasons why uh, there hasn't been a lot of Section 34 uh, prosecutions. But 34A is different. And there's also a huge incentive for the state to prosecute 34A. And the reason is they could possibly obtain significant financial penalties from corporates. Uh, whereas a prosecution of, of 34 will be against an individual. That person holds a position of authority. So the state, I think, sometimes make a commercial decision. Is it is it worth it to go after this person, spend a couple of years investigating and prosecuting to, at the end of the day, see a relatively low-level employee go to prison? It's uh, They would rather focus their effort on, on, on 34A uh, in terms of which they can get uh, bigger penalties. And then... If you want to touch on another yes, question. Yes, uh, I've got quite an interesting question, which I'd like to tackle. Uh, the question is, if a, a multinational conducts FCPA training, will this be sufficient? Or does the SA entity require tailored training, including Section 34A 
uh, considerations. And uh, the answer to that is they will require tailored training. Uh, the FCPA is not the same as PRECA. It, it criminalizes different conduct. And I, I think the key limitation of the FCPA is that it focuses on uh, foreign public officials, whereas uh, the the PRECA, much like the UK Bribery Act, here we're, we're criminalizing both private and public sector bribery. Um, so PRECA is much broader in scope in that regard. And also there are, are particular nuances that you'd want to focus on in addition to that legal risk. So the answer to the question is you, you definitely need to create bespoke training that focuses on PRECA, that focuses on 34A. And whilst a lot might be covered and a lot of the good stuff that you might need to put in place uh, to ensure FCPA compliance is great, it's not necessarily and it's not a guarantee uh, that it's going to be sufficient to cover all the requirements locally. Thanks. Thanks very much, Adrian. Uh, I think here's also a very um, interesting question that I should have dealt with in the in the webinar, and that is Aniki Stein asking, are there specific penalties set out for non-compliance with Section uh, 34A? Um, interestingly, uh, no, there's not. Uh, so that's an omission by the legislature. The the uh, the PRECA has twenty uh, section twenty six that that speaks to uh, penalties uh, and so forth, but it doesn't refer to section thirty four A at all. Uh, but that doesn't mean, of course, that you can't go to prison or a fine cannot be imposed. Uh, it just means the, the 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 court will have to rely on another provision, and I think that provision is section uh, two hundred and seventy six of the Criminal Procedure Act. That, in short, says a court can decide what penalty or imprisonment to impose upon conviction. But we will a, a a good indication will probably be to look at section twenty six, and there the consequences are quite severe. Uh, in some instances, it could be life imprisonment. Um, and as far as the penalty is concerned, um, it, it will most likely be uh, accord with the, 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 the financial crime. So if it's 500 million involved, it could be along those lines. It will depend on the benefit or, 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 or the actual crime. And on this score, um, what is also quite interesting, and you probably would have picked it up whilst we were talking, is so although Section 34A is aimed at, I would say, corporate bodies, um, uh, companies and the like, and state-owned uh, entities, it, it could also be uh, targeted at natural persons. That's why I also include the possibility of imprisonment. But of course, as you'll know, you, a company cannot go to, to prison. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Pim. Um, I think uh, there's perhaps one quick question I can answer before before we wrap up. Uh, I've got a question, which is uh, prevention uh, is better. Uh, should we prevent appointing people who would be prone to bribe, etc.? Would this be seen as a mitigating factor? Absolutely. Uh, we need to take a really high level holistic view of the whole uh, anti-corruption compliance program within an organization, and that can begin at the hiring process. Do you have a proper vetting you know, procedure in place? Are you training your employees? All, all of this is relevant. So um, absolutely, that could be a mitigating factor if you're, you're taking steps to ensure that you're hiring the right people. Um, then before we wrap up, just a big thank you again uh, from, from myself or for everyone for attending. Um, Stephen, is there anything that you wanted to add uh, before we close off? All right, just to echo your words, to thank everyone for their attendance. It's been a great attendance and I hope that there's been some useful information that we shared and that all of you are prepared to embrace the new legislation and make sure that you never fall on the wrong side of it. If I can just add, I think there is appetite for enforcement. Enforcement is the major criticism of South Africa in the FATF peer report. And that is, this is something that I think the government is taking seriously and will be addressing. So I think we are going to see prosecutions and vermeet the nail on the head. It's much easier to extract revenue from corporates than individuals. And if you look at what the US and the UK do, they extract millions of dollars and pounds in revenue from companies who get onto the wrong side of enforcement without having to, without the regulator even having to prove the corruption. So it is a big risk. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Adrian. Thanks very much, everyone. Thanks very much.